kidney failure. So changing my diet, taking the medications, all that's out the window? You'll still need to change your diet and take medication, but unfortunately, you were already in the later stages of chronic kidney disease. And because we have to begin the process of cleaning your blood right away, we will insert a temporary catheter into your neck that connects to a dialysis machine. We're also starting you on meds for diabetes. Wait, wait, so I'm starting dialysis today. You are. The different types of dialysis, or renal replacement therapy, I like to call it, um, are primarily peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. So with hemodialysis, that's blood dialysis. Hemo means blood. So we are actually taking someone's blood out, cleaning it in a machine, and putting their blood, their clean blood, back, okay? That usually starts with a catheter that we put in a deep vein, right? And then it transitions to a fistula or a graft, or that's basically an artery and a vein are surgically attached to allow for an access point for needles to go in and clean the blood. But that's hemodialysis or blood dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is actually, I call it tummy dialysis, okay? So peritoneum is the undersurface of your abdominal cavity or your belly. It's the undersurface of your belly. And the reason that that's beautiful is because it's a slow kidney. It's full of blood vessels that are small, like the, like the kidney blood vessels, that specialized ball of blood vessels that we talked about earlier. And that allows toxins to leach out of the bloodstream into the fluid that we put into that belly, and then we dump the fluid out. So the way it works, you get a catheter into the belly that attaches to the belly. It then can attach to, well, it can attach to bags first, and then fluid goes in that doesn't have toxin in it. Your blood puts toxin in that fluid, and then we dump that fluid out and add more clean fluid, and that's how we kind of remove those toxins over time. Once I started dialysis, I made sure that I stayed in compliance, which meant I did not miss any appointments. Whenever I had to go to the doctor, I went to the doctor. Whenever I needed blood work, I did the blood work, and I maintained my diet so that I didn't get any, gain any weight or anything. I started out with peritoneal, and um, except for maybe when events are going on and you know you have so many hours that you have to do the dialysis that I had to cut out some events because everybody else was still up partying or whatever and I'd have to go to bed so I could get my number of hours in. And then I got an infection and uh, I ended up with perit uh, peritonitis and so they tried to reinsert the uh, the two, but I couldn't, so I ended up having to go on to hemodialysis. But I got used to it. You know, it was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I knew where I was going, and so I, my life went on as usual. My mom is a caregiver, and one of her patients, she takes to dialysis three times a week. Um, my aunt had a friend who was in dialysis all the years of his later life. Um, so I know about that. I have friends who have donated to their partners because they were a match. They were able to donate a kidney. Um, so I have not been affected personally, but I do know of it. And I know of people who have gone on their journeys with it. And it's really amazing what can be done. And you know Dr. Jones. Yeah. And what if Beverly and one of Dr. Jones' white patients has a problem at the same time? Who do you think's gonna get her attention first, huh? She can't watch Beverly 24 hours. So when Dr. Jones goes home, what if this new doctor that comes in is someone who wears a white sheet on his days off? Beverly's my only child. I will not have someone butchering my baby. Why I think there's mistrust um, from the African-American community uh, towards hospitals and doctors is because, it, well, it started way back when, I mean, since the beginning of time. The mistrust comes from history. It comes from knowing that your ancestors were often uh, the subject of medical experiments that would benefit uh, white people. 
and with no anesthesia. You know, they would experiment on, on, on black women um, and with n no anesthesia and then take that information and, and to benefit the white community. Um, it was, wasn't even a secret that, that we were seen as less than human. The African-American people were not treated the same as their, let's say, white counterparts. Um, always looked down as second class, um, always given lesser medications or, or, or lesser procedures, and oh, well, that'll be fine because they don't necessarily deserve this anyway. We're gonna save this for the people who do deserve it, who can pay for it, who are upstanding citizens, who will continue you know, moving our, our cities and our cultures and our children along. Mm, not so much here. Shirley's process, I think, um, having had that experience as a woman of color, uh, sometimes it's hard for actors to have that heavy burden of that entire community and allowing that to like be expressed. But, you know, I just did my best to create a safe environment for her to be able to access uh, those emotions. Historically speaking, like how people of color have been treated in this country with respect to the healthcare system, that none of that was news to me. I walked it, I've seen it, I've experienced it. I'm Latina, um, I'm privileged with white skin. And so that's not lost on me in the fact that I get to sort of walk both worlds. Um, so in terms of, you know, connecting with the story, I really wanted to amplify that fear and seeing like, you know, for example, like we had this whole scene when Beverly first walks in to get that information that she, where she really is in terms of like her results and, you know, her approach looking at the doctor, she just, it was scary to her. My personal experience with mistrust in the medical community, um, as, as a woman of color, going into facilities and seeing doctors and having a doctor ask you, oh, well, how did you get such good doctors? Just to have that question thrown at me is, what, because I deserve them? Like, why would you, do you ask everyone that question? Or, you know, in the hospital and having a baby and not being treated the way you should because they think you're, oh, you're not in that much pain, you're fine. Or think I just want extra drugs. That's not the case. I'm not doing okay, but being dismissed and not taken seriously. People of color in the communities don't feel like they're taken seriously when they go into medical offices because maybe they think they don't have as much money and they don't deserve the same type of care, which of course is not true. But in our communities, you can't help but say, well, I'm not gonna go because you don't take my problem seriously. From personal experience, I don't trust no doctors. <laughs> I don't feel like I can trust doctors. Um, don't ask me where that came from, because I honestly have no idea. Uh, I think it's kind of embedded in our community. The ethos of the black community is that there's a lack of respect for the community itself. When someone walks into the ER, the physician automatically says, this person is drug seeking. We get that. So there is a lack of trust that you are actually gonna have our best interest at heart before we even hit the door. So for me, it's breaking down the sensitivity and really taking a deep dive and actually asking the question and allowing us to ask the question and actually tell the medical establishment what we need as a community. And I say we because I'm part of that community. I, as a nephrologist, have walked into an ER and been treated like a second-class citizen just by virtue of how I looked. And so we can't, we can't hide from that. I had a situation where I had a patient who uh, had sickle cell, and which um, is very painful. And the patient had been labeled um, historically as uh, drug seeking. Well, it hurts, so you need meds, right? And so with that being said, um, this drug seeking behavior was listed all through the chart. And then I remember there was a first year medical student who had written and quoted from a, a journal um, that basically talked about um, the stereotypes of black patients um, being labeled as drug seeking in the, in, the, in hospital settings, and how um, you know they're more likely to be labeled in that in the sense that they're not they're not getting their pain treated, and that other medical issues are being dismissed. Both of my parents are very 
not trusting of the medical field. And it's probably, it stems from what had happened with my grandfather who had stage four brain cancer. And he just wasn't treated fast enough. There were, there was a lot leading up to it and the doctors didn't take it seriously. And so they definitely, they already had a mistrust before then, but that situation didn't help. And that was, I think, three years ago. And people are like, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor. They're not going to believe me or they're going to ignore me or dismiss me. Um, and so I just think it just, um, you know, perseverates and goes on and on and on. It just gets passed down in conversations along with just the myths that go along with it. People think, oh, I don't want to be an organ donor because if I put that on my license and I get in an accident, then they're not going to keep me alive. They're just going to keep my organs. You know, there's all these things that um, we hear in our community that aren't true. Um, and it's a tough crowd, right, to have to try to you know, constantly be the one to provide that education, but it just starts with one of us. How do you get health literacy from someone who doesn't look like you, who you don't trust in the first place? That gets us back to, again, this socioeconomics. If you look at how many African-American physicians there are who do what I do, there's a paucity of us, which is why I'm glad you reached out to me to actually do this because if nothing more, people need to see my face talking that, no, no, this is good medicine. No, no, this is what we need to be doing, you know? And it's coming from someone who grew up like you, who ate the same stuff that you eat, who has experienced the same cultural ethos that you've experienced. So there, there's something about that. So because there are so few of us, we've got to be able to take a deep dive into what that cultural ethos really comes from, what it means, and there are a myriad of factors as to why. I see the Link by Love series uh, helping to decrease mistrust of doctors in, in a few different ways. I think because the series kind of hits the topic head on, it doesn't avoid it. These are issues that were concerns in the African American community that, that are real. And so acknowledging that and incorporating it into the sto storyline I think was brilliant uh, from, the, from the writing and producing perspective because it's real. There are people who, who definitely believe based on historical mistreatment um, that, that doctors today will still not treat uh, patients of color. And so I think by face, he, hitting that head on, it was important to do that, to kind of say, we hear you, we acknowledge you, and this is real, and not trying to sweep it under the rug. Hitting those things head on, I think, is important to address those myths and misconceptions because it, it gets perpetuated. I wanted it to be a discussion. Um, this, is, this is how we handle things in our own communities. Um, I, I don't want my daughter being butchered. I don't want my daughter to be subject to some of the things that I saw growing up. These are all things that, that Ernestine saw in her day. And um, while some may dismiss that as, oh, that's an old way of thinking, it's very relevant today. I feel like sometimes doctors will come in and they say what they have to say, what they're used to saying. and they'll move on to the next patient. And I make sure, myself, and like I said in a nice way, I say, excuse me, doc, I'm not understanding. This is the first time I've been through this. Can you explain to me a little more in detail what this means? Like I have degenerative cartilage in my knees. I have, uh, I'm in my 40s, but I have 60-year-old knees. I've had my first surgery when I was 16. Um, I have arthritis in both knees now. Certain things I can't do. I can't go play ball like I used to. I can't do things like I used to because I will need knee replacement soon. So I had to change the way I went about things. I didn't, when I first went to the doctor, he was just like, oh, you know, yeah, don't, don't play basketball, do this. And I had to understand. So what I, I find myself doing is wanting to be more thorough. Nobody exists in a vacuum. So we're in a culture that tells us that white is right a lot of times um, and that whoever has on a lab coat is, <laughs> is the authority on your health. And th they're afraid. Docere means to teach. That's the root word of doctor. It means to teach. So we've got to be in that receptive mode to understand what our students are doing and understand where our students are before we can actually treat them. So yes, I want white physicians to treat black people. I want other physicians to treat black people. There aren't enough of us to go around. We can't do it all. But that's my job is to make sure 
that black people understand that the medical establishment is not bad, but this is how you make it work for you by speaking up, by asking questions, by then going back and doing your own research. Leave Google Doctor alone, okay? If you're gonna do Google Doctor, be honest with the doctor. Tell him, hey, look, I looked this up on Google. What do you think about this? And if the doctor blows you off, leave him alone. Leave him alone because he, he doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care that you're trying to educate yourself. He doesn't care about your health literacy. Leave him alone. I think the way that I would share or encourage someone who is hesitant about seeking out specialty health care or just specific health care in any way would just to have a conversation with them and just say, you deserve the best. Your family deserves to have you here. You deserve to take care of yourself just like anyone else. Why wouldn't you do that for yourself and for your family?